the name of congressional committees used to be the one thing that no member of Congress was lying about. The very first committee established in the House of Representatives in 1789 was the Ways and Means Committee. That remains the name of that committee. It is archaic sounding language now, but it was very clear in 1789 that the Ways and Means Committee would provide the ways and the means for the government to do what it had to do. In other words, it would raise the money. Over the next couple of decades, Washington language evolved to a level of clarity that makes perfect and obvious sense today. And so, in 1816, the Senate created the Finance Committee. Finance Committee in the Senate does exactly what the Ways and Means Committee in the House does. It raises the money through taxation and tariffs to pay for the government. The Finance Committee does what it sounds like it does. The Foreign Relations Committee has jurisdiction over exactly what it sounds like. The Veteran Affairs Committee, established in 1970, couldn't be more clear in its jurisdiction. It's right there in the title of the committee, as it is with virtually every other committee. And so it went until Republicans in today's House of Representatives thought up a new committee, which Alex correctly, correctly points out is actually a subcommittee, to be run by rabid, right-wing, election-denying, relentless, Trump-echoing Jim Jordan. And when you lie as much as Donald Trump and Jim Jordan, you are going to lie about the new House committee you create, and you are going to put the lie right there in the name of the committee. And that's why on this program, I avoid in every way possible saying the name of that committee, because that is Jim Jordan trying to force me to use his words, which are a lie, in describing the work of that committee. I don't have that problem with any other congressional committee in history, because committee names were never a lie until now. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to use the phrase semantic infiltration to describe this phenomenon. It's when you force your opponent to use your language to describe something. That's why, I, as I said, I never want to use the word Fox and the word news beside each other. Rupert Murdoch knew he could force the entire news industry to call what he was doing news when he created a television propaganda channel and called it news. If you use the word Fox and the word news beside each other, you are falling victim to Rupert Murdoch's semantic infiltration of your brain. And everyone in the news business does it. Rupert Murdoch owns that cell of their brains and forces them to call the poison that he spews news. In a deal Kevin McCarthy made with Republicans who are even more fanatical than he is in order to get their votes to make him speaker, he agreed to make a com to create a committee whose title is a lie. The committee's claim is that it would investigate the way government, especially the investigative powers of government, have been used in unfair ways. Now, I would be happy to cheer on a congressional committee like that if for the first time in the history of the Congress, for example, they were going to take an interest in the ultimate governmental power, the power of government to kill, and how that might be used unfairly. If that committee were investigating, for example, how police officers, including federal law enforcement officers, in the street can unfairly become judge, jury, and executioner in one moment and kill unarmed people, particularly unarmed black men in the street like Michael Brown and George Floyd and thousands of others during my lifetime. That's a version of that committee that I could support and be interested in. I'm sure many other people could fairly support a committee 
that was fairly trying to investigate how governmental power can be used unfairly. But the Jim Jordan Committee was invented exclusively to pretend to investigate what they claim is investigative unfairness against Republicans, especially Republicans named Trump, by federal law enforcement officials and national security officials. They have not been able to come up with one day of true testimony demonstrating anything unfair in the federal investigative process. And surely there are many unfair things in the federal investigative process. But they aren't necessarily partisan things. So those things are of no interest to the Republican liars, and they are all liars on that committee because the very first lie they tell every time that committee meets is the lie they tell about the purpose of the committee, which they have written into the very title of the committee. The only committee in congressional history whose name is a lie, whose name is so far a very successful execution of semantic infiltration. Everyone else in the news media uses the name of this committee as if it is the legitimate name of a congressional committee and as if it reveals something about what the committee actually does instead of realizing that the mere utterance of the name of the committee is a participation in the lie that the committee's existence represents. Today, Jim Jordan presented three former FBI agents. They are former FBI agents for a reason. They have had their security clearances revoked. They violated the most elementary rules of the FBI in some cases. In a letter from the FBI to Jim Jordan, the FBI said that their, quote, allegiance to the United States was in doubt. That, of course, is true of Jim Jordan. His allegiance to the United States is in doubt. He tried to overturn the last presidential election illegally. His only known allegiance is to Donald Trump and to his own power. Jim Jordan claimed that the former FBI agents were whistleblowers, but blew no whistles today. And whistleblower is actually now an official status obtainable by law in Washington. And these three do not qualify legally for whistleblower status, but they do qualify for the description of disgruntled former employees. Marcus Allen's top secret security clearance was revoked after the FBI found that he had expressed sympathy for persons or organizations that advocate, threaten, or use, uh, or use of force of violence, the FBI letter to Jim Jordan said. Stephen Friend's security clearance was revoked after he refused last summer to take part in an arrest of a January 6th suspect. According to the FBI letter, Mr. Friend espoused an alternative narrative about the events at the U.S. Capitol. That was the FBI's phrase. And he espoused that narrative during his communications with his supervisors about refusing to participate in that arrest. The FBI letter also noted that in September 2022, Mr. Friend downloaded documents from FBI computer systems to an unauthorized, removable flash drive. That's an excellent reason to be a former FBI agent. Jim Jordan makes up his own rules as he goes along. So for the first time in congressional history, he has refused to share interview transcripts of witnesses with every member of the committee. I'm not aware that you're able to withhold information from the minority that we would need to use to prepare for a... When it comes to whistleblowers, you're not. And I would just, I would just remind the committee, remind whistle... everyone, look, Mr. when it comes Chairman, to whistleblowers, right. you are not. That's not right. It's it's shocking that the that gentleman. That's not right. It's shocking that fact, the gentleman. Talk so much about Mr. the whistleblower Chairman, and the impeachment. It's shocking that the gentleman from New York all of the information that we had when you were part yes, of an investigation with an anonymous the whistleblower. You had. When it comes to whistleblowers, you were not entitled to it. That's these at the discretion of Mr. Allen. Mr. Chairman, these individuals said, have been determined not, not to be whistleblowers. To these are not whistleblowers. They've been determined by the agency not to be whistleblowers. Are you deciding that they're whistleblowers? Yes, the law decides. The law has not determined they are whistleblowers. Congressman Dan Goldman cited the rules that Chairman Jordan clearly did not know exist. 
The point of order is why does no, Rule 11, yeah. Clause 2, Subsection E1A not apply to this subcommittee? I can read for you. Each committee shall keep a complete record of all committee action, which shall include, in the case of a meeting or hearing transcript, a substantially verbatim account of remarks we actually it. made during the proceedings, subject only to some technical things. Such records shall be the property of the House, and each member, delegate, and the resident commissioner shall have access there, too. Why does that not apply? Where is the whistleblower exception in the rules a, of Congress that says that it's, does it's not the apply? It's prerogative of the committee to decide. No, we it's have not. The, we have, it's the rules of the have, House. We have the whistleblower testimony. The whistleblower does not wish that to be made available to the Democrats at this the time. The whistleblower doesn't make committee Mr. rules. Lynch. The senior ranking Democrat on the committee, Stacey Plaskett, who will join us in a moment, assessed the hearing this way. Less than two months ago, former President Trump, facing mounting investigations into his many alleged crimes, declared that, quote, Republicans in Congress should defund the DOJ and the FBI until they can come to their senses. And we all know that when Trump says jump, the Republicans in the House say how high. So here we are on police week, watching House Republicans jump to lay the foundation to defund law enforcement. My colleagues on the far right are on a mission to attack, discredit, and ultimately dismantle the FBI. This is defund the police on steroids. As part of their mission, my colleagues have brought in these former agents, men who lost their security clearances, because they were a threat to our national security, who, out of malice or ignorance or both, have put partisan agenda above the oath they swore to serve this country and protect its national security. My Republican colleagues aren't here representing their constituents, not my constituents. They're representing Donald Trump. They're acting as his defense attorney, his campaign operative, and everything in between. This committee, this select committee, is a clearinghouse for testing conspiracy theories for Donald Trump to use in his 2024 presidential campaign. What's clear from these hearings is that Donald Trump knows just as well as I do that the danger to him and his MAGA movement is the rule of law. Senator Markey, you are the first senators ever to say this to a president of the United States. Uh, the debt ceiling has been around for almost 100 years. It's never come to this before. Uh, what brought you to the point where you're urging the president to, in effect, just ignore Congress and go ahead himself? Well, it's pretty clear that Speaker McCarthy is tethered to the most right-wing, radical, conservative members of his caucus. Uh, and he cannot reach a deal that does not, in fact, uh, result in absolutely unconscionable cuts to programs that affect the poorest, the most vulnerable in our society. And we just can't, as a country, allow for something that is unconstitutional to be used uh, by these uh, radical right-wingers uh, as a way of extracting concessions time after time uh, at, at this critical uh, debt ceiling uh, moment in our history. When Donald Trump was president, the deficit, the debt went up $8 trillion, huge increases in defense spending, trillions of dollars of tax breaks for the rich, uh, for billionaires and millionaires. They didn't care at all. But once Joe Biden gets in, the crocodile's tails are shed, and they want to shut down the government if they don't get these cuts for who? The billionaires, the defense uh, budget? No, 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 for the poorest in our society. Well, the United States uh, Constitution, um, Article 14, says quite clearly that the validity of the public debt, as authorized by law, shall not be questioned as authorized by law, means all of the bills that have already passed. They're already the law. 
you've already gone out with your credit card and bought all this stuff, and now the bill has arrived, and the Constitution says you must pay it. So I think this might be just the right moment to once and for all stop this nonsense. Uh, Let's what? just invoke the 14th Amendment and never again have this crazy situation where the most right-wing radical elements are able to hold our economy and the global economy hostage. Let's listen to what one of your constituents has to say about this. Uh, one of your constituents in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard Law professor Lawrence Tribe. But the real question isn't what powers does the president have? It is what duties does the president have? Does the president have a duty to execute all the laws of the United States, the ones that Congress passed telling him to spend money? He does have that duty. Senator, I have to say that use of the professor's focus on duty really sharpened uh, my ability to see this point uh, the way he's making it. Well, of course, uh, Lawrence Tribe, as usual, is right on the money. He's the leading constitutional expert in our country. Uh, the 14th Amendment is very clear. Uh, and if we were having a reasonable negotiation with Republicans, if there was a way where both sides were coming to the table, if the tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires uh, were a part of this discussion, then we probably wouldn't be having this discussion. But none of those things are happening. And so as a result, maybe it's the clarifying historical moment where we look back at the wisdom uh, of the, that post-Civil War Reconstruction era of Congress uh, when they enshrined into the Constitution the requirement uh, that the American government pay its bills, that they are valid, they shall not be questioned. And uh, I, I would say that it's not something that comes easily, I think, to uh, the political process, but I think Kevin McCarthy will not have the leeway. I agree with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think his hands are going to be tied. And I think if they are, and we're heading into default, there is one short and certain way out, and that's invoking the 14th Amendment.